Well, good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour. It's good to see you again this morning. I want to give a little plug for next week's Equipping Hour. Um, I want to invite you to be here and then be able to look forward to next week's Equipping Hour as something of a resource. Uh, Jake Hantla will be uh, teaching Equipping Hour on the topic of cancer. I think the title of his message is, uh, I have cancer, what do I do next? Uh, or what do I do now? Or something along those lines. But uh, I, I trust it will be a, a helpful uh, introduction and instruction um, and uh, something that will be a benefit to us. So uh, be here next week for that. This morning we're going to close out our time discussing evangelism. And um, I want to do that with uh, a final installment this morning and to put before you an example of evangelism from the life of the Apostle Paul. So you can turn in your Bibles to Acts 26, and I'll open us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Uh, We thank you for the great privilege it is to know the gospel, to be forgiven of our sins, to have been rescued out of the dominion of darkness and placed into light, to have been raised from the dead and given life, to have our blindness healed, and to see. All of these things are gifts from you. We could not arrange them. We were not looking for them. This is all of your grace. And in your grace, you used means. You used someone proclaiming the gospel perhaps feebly, fearfully, imperfectly, and you brought us by your perfect hand to life. God, we pray that you would normalize for us evangelism and the evangelistic task that you would cause us to go out from this place, however fearfully and feebly we might, to go with your courage to go with your truth, and to be eager to be used by you to accomplish things that could not be done apart from supernatural power. We want to be instruments in your hands to that end, even as you, as you have used others to bring us to saving faith. We ask for your help as we close out this series. I, I pray that evangelism would not be left in the realm of the experts with all the answers but would in fact be the job description of all the redeemed. I pray that we would feel that, revel in that, um, and seek to be used by you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. In this series, we have looked at the reasons to do evangelism. We've examined some methods of evangelism. Um, Neither of those were exhaustive. Uh, There are many ways to proclaim the gospel. We talked about the platforms for evangelism, a consistent life, the platform of suffering. Uh, We've looked at the content of evangelism. What must be said? Uh, What are the bare minimum facts that must be presented? What information uh, is critical to evangelism? And then last week we talked about the theology of evangelism. When we start telling people about Christ, we we don't forget our theology. We don't forget a right view of man and a right view of God and a realization that what must take place for someone to embrace the gospel is in fact supernatural. The dead must be raised. So uh, we learn to be dependent all over again. And this morning, I just want to put a, a cap on this series by looking at the example of the Apostle Paul in Acts 26. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a frog in there somewhere. And I want to see in the Apostle Paul one episode where he explains the gospel. He is doing evangelism. He's actually filling out his role as an evangelist. And it's interesting for us to see how he does it. We, we recognize in Acts 26 uh, right up front that there is no formula. There is no formulaic expression of gospel truth. We see also that Paul will marry his evangelism to his own personal testimony. He's telling his life story <clears throat> as he's explaining uh, the facts of the gospel. Thank you, Melissa. 
Appreciate that. Chris was on his way. People are fighting to grab a bottle of water for me. <clears throat> Thank you. So in Acts 26, you have the scene where Paul is on his way to Rome. Paul has appealed to Caesar in the midst of Jewish mobs who have been upset that he would preach not only the resurrection, but preach the resurrection and its benefits to Gentiles. And that was offensive, uh, particularly to the Judaizers. And so uh, they had found ways in every city to get a mob going against Paul so that the Roman authorities who believed in peace, who didn't want to be bothered by riotous mobs, would do something about anything that violated the peace. So there's some guy at the center of some disruption. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> we have to solve this problem. We've got to get rid of this guy. So Paul is in custody in a number of different ways, eventually on his way to Rome, and he is appealed to Caesar. It's fascinating that you have a character like Felix at the end of Acts 24, who was being entertained by Paul. Paul is preaching the gospel to Felix, and Felix likes listening to Paul. Uh, he thinks he might get a bribe, and so he just lets Paul kind of wallow in prison. And it's interesting, in verse 27 at the end of Acts 24, after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. And you just think, wow, two years of Paul's life just sort of wasted because of the whim of some petty ruler, some mid-level bureaucrat in the Roman Empire. It was entertained, looking for a bribe, and then, ah, whatever, I'll just leave him till Felix gets here, or Festus gets here. So Festus is sort of a, a, a regional ruler, a, a proconsul, and he's in charge. And then King Agrippa comes in Acts 26 to visit. And uh, Festus and Agrippa are talking together. And Agrippa is called a king, although he's not really a king in the truest sense. He's not sovereign. He's just the ruler over Judea. And he is underneath the, the, the reign of Caesar in the Roman Empire. And you have this exchange where Paul gets presented before Agrippa. Look down at Acts 26. We'll read this whole chapter just to get this scene, and then we'll look carefully at verse 18. Now Agrippa said to Paul, You're permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul, stretching out his hand, began to make his defense. Concerning all the things of which I'm accused by the Jews, I regard myself blessed, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then all Jews know my manner of life from my youth, which began from the beginning, uh, which was from the beginning spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they're willing to testify, that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I am suffering here, being tried for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered unbelievable among all of you if God does raise the dead? So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus the Nazarene. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged, I was journeying to Damascus with authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise up, stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a servant and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. 
And then listen to verse 18. This is the job description Jesus gave to Paul. And this is the job description of the evangelist. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the authority of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the regions of Judea, even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, practicing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and were trying to put me to death. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand here bearing witness to both small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that as first to the resurrection from the dead, he was going to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Now, while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. But Agrippa replied to Paul, In such short time are you persuading me to become a Christian? And Paul said, I would pray to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but all those who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. And the king stood up and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. What's fascinating in this scene is Paul just takes advantage of the situation God has provided. He's permitted to speak, and what does he speak? The gospel that these men need. And he does it in the context of his own life's story. Now, job descriptions are important. If you're going to go to all the trouble of getting an education, looking for employment, filling out applications, going through interviews, getting necessary training, you should probably know what it is you're expected to do. The cartoonist, Scott Adams, famous for the Dilbert cartoons, asked a number of people in various fields to submit a one-sentence description of their jobs. Here are some of the submissions he received. I'll give you the job description and you can guess in your mind what the job was. To read things that don't matter, then write papers saying they do matter for points that don't matter in order to get a job doing something totally unrelated. Student. Job description of a student. Here's another one. Take numbers down on a piece of paper, rearrange them and put them on different pieces of paper. Accountant. Draw up plans for something that will not be built according to those plans. A civil engineer submitted that one. Spend most of the day looking out the window. Pilot. That's a good thing, I guess. Misinterpret the universe, submitted one. An astronomer submitted that one. Repeatedly fix what you repeatedly break. IT director. And I like this one. Talk in other people's sleep. A college professor. (laughs) What we're looking at in Acts 26.18 is the job description of the Apostle Paul. And I think it is the job description of the evangelist. When you go across the street to the apartments, when you go to ASU and walk around and meet students and try to get a conversation going, uh, when you meet the inebriated crowds at Mill Avenue, or when you're sharing the gospel with a toddler in your home, or a family member, or a coworker, a fellow student, what is it we are supposed to do? I believe this job description is given for us in Acts 26.18. Look down at it again. Let's read it carefully. To open their eyes 
so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the authority of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. That is a great description of evangelism. Paul's defense here before King Agrippa, this is Herod Agrippa II, the son of Herod Agrippa. He's the great-grandson of Herod the Great, and he was the ruler of a small conglomeration of cities in Judea and surrounding areas. Paul's appeal to Caesar meant he was on his way to Rome, but nobody wanted to send Paul up to Rome without knowing what they were sending him for. What is he being accused of? Can, am I going to get embarrassed by Caesar by sending this guy up there and I don't even know what's going on? And so Herod Agrippa holds this hearing for Paul. The, the Herodian dynasty was sort of Jewish. The, the, the Herodians were sort of half Jewish, and then uh, Herod the Great had married a Jewish wife. And so there were, there were people who um, were interested in Judaism, but then had to rule Judaism, not from a believing standpoint, but from a standpoint of maintaining power and submitting to the Roman Empire. Here in Acts 26, Paul is a prisoner and he's brought to defend himself. And you can imagine what you might do. You, you might try to get out of legal trouble. That was not Paul's first impulse here. <laughs> Look at these people I'm in front of. How will they ever hear the gospel? But I'm here, I know the gospel, and they need to know it. Paul is taking strategic advantage of a particular situation of suffering in which God had placed him. Listen, if you know that your job description on this earth is evangelist, testifier to the greatness of God and His coming kingdom, a testifier to the gospel and the only way of forgiveness, if you know that's your job description, then whatever courtrooms you find yourself in, whatever maladies you are under, whatever difficult relationships you are in, that job description clarifies what you are to do next. Paul does that here to testify of God's sovereign grace. He's been commissioned by Jesus to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Here's some Gentiles. <laughs> Preach the gospel. Verse 18 is comprised of several telescoping phrases that outline Paul's task according to five of sinful humanity's most pressing needs. Paul's commanded to open their eyes so that they can turn, so that they may receive. You see, humanity needs blindness removed in order to turn from darkness to light, from Satan's dominion to God's dominion, in order to receive forgiveness of sin, and in order to receive a place among those who are separated out by God's love. So where does this all start? Opening the eyes. This is Paul's job description. And you remember John 9.32? where people said, since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. This imagery reflects the stark impossibility of evangelism. Paul's job description, go open their eyes. Sure, no one's ever done that. That is the task. This is the job description of a rescued man to meet humanity's most pressing needs. We'll, we'll sort of outline these five needs in order. Sight, repentance, deliverance, forgiveness, and belonging. And, and this, is a, this is an impossible task. Let's start with sight. The first pressing need of mankind described in this passage is sight. And if you've ever been on a commercial flight, you've heard the instructions. In the event of an emergency, emergency lighting will illuminate the path to the emergency exits. White lights lead to red lights, which indicate your emergency exit doors. Have you heard the speech? Have you heard it enough times to tune it out? Would you know what to do if there were an emergency? If there was ever a need to get out of a plane in a hurry, you'd want to be able to find those white lights that lead to red lights that indicate your emergency exit. Can you imagine the chaos and confusion in a real emergency situation? The overhead lights are out. Perhaps smoke is filling the cabin. People are scrambling and clamoring and climbing this way and that. If only you knew where the exit was. But you're still wearing the eye mask shade thing that you bought in the terminal. 
And no matter how hard you look, you can't make out the exit. You can't make out any lights at all. If only you could see. The world around us is in that darkness. In fact, the world around us is that darkness. Apart from Christ, everybody is blind spiritually. Until Jesus turns on the lights of the heart, we are not able to see clearly to make our way out. Existence in this world is a twilight shadow of dismal grays and indiscernible shades. And we see this manifested in the moral confusion of our day. Every human has the notion that right and wrong exist, but few agree on what actually is right and wrong. Everyone has that moral compass we talked about, but men and women abandon the light. No one reads the compass correctly. And what's worse, in our blindness, we scratch new markings on that compass. We reprogram it. South is north, wrong is right. Everyone has an opinion, so categories of north and right don't really even matter anymore. We end up with indifference and relativism, moral equivalence. Anything goes. The real sin in the world now is to not endorse everybody's love of darkness. Our world can't be trusted to tell what's right and wrong because the darkness is committed to its own darkness. Those committed to that darkness run from the light. We talked about that in John 3, 19 to 21. Men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. If only they could see. This blindness is not just manifest in those who have jettisoned the idea of morality. The blindness is also evident in those who intend to invent their own moralities in the world's religions. The world's religions are essentially the blind leading the blind into destruction. Without a relationship to God through Jesus, the true light which enlightens men, people forge their own paths trudging through more darkness. And then they labor to make themselves feel good by their religion. And in doing so, they pile on more darkness. Following any one of man's many religions is like squinting hard through fog on a dark night, trying to keep up with a crowd of people ahead who are working hard to convince each other that their leader knows the way. Being a leader of any one of man's religions is like squinting hard through that same fog on a dark night, but holding up the bottom of a shattered incandescent light bulb, convincing people you have the light. The problem is the glass is broken. The filament is long gone. You don't have a lamp to put it in. You have no extension cord and no source of electricity. It's dark outside and foggy, and you're wearing a scarf around your face. Your eyes have been plucked out, and yet you cry, I've been enlightened, I see the truth, follow me. And a crowd of your fellow blind men stumble behind you into further darkness, hoping against hope that you're on to something. If only they could see. This is why Jesus came. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. In John eight twelve, Jesus said to them, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. And then to make obvious his credentials to say such an audacious thing, Jesus healed a man blind from birth, John 9. This is an indication that the power behind evangelism is the power of Christ. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. But what happens when we preach the gospel? 2 Corinthians 4, 6. The light of heaven shines in the heart to open the eyes so that we can see the glory of God in the face of Christ. This is supernatural. And Paul experienced this miraculous transformation himself, just as he described King Agrippa. And now he's an ambassador of the light, commissioned by Jesus as opener of eyes. 
Humanity's most pressing need is not merely to acquire spiritual sight, but according to Acts 26.18, to acquire sight, notice this, so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the authority of Satan to God. They need repentance. The lights need to be turned on, and repentance needs to happen. Now that the blindfold is removed, you can see the difference between what is light and what is dark. You can see the white lights that lead to red lights that lead to the emergency exit. So now, turn. Turn from the darkness to the light. The turning that Paul describes here demands a turning around from one thing to another. As we talked about last week, if if you present the gospel without repentance... In other words, if you're speaking to an unbeliever and the way you're presenting the gospel doesn't present for them a conflict, you're going the wrong way, you need to go the right way. If it doesn't unearth the idolatries that keep them worshiping anything other than God, then then our task of evangelism isn't finished with that individual. The opening the eyes leads to repentance. Repentance is that 180 degree turn From idolatry to the one true God, from error to truth, from sin to righteousness. It's a change of mind accompanied by a corresponding change in life and actions and motivations. And listen, you can't repent until your spiritual eyes are open. But once Jesus opens the eyes, repentance is the inevitable result. Now, rather than loving darkness... And scurrying to more darkness away from the light, having experienced the light, you love what the light produces. You have a newfound love for light and life and truth. Humanity's most pressing need is to receive sight so that they may turn first from darkness to light and then next from Satan's dominion to God's. Look how verse 18 says it. So that they may turn from darkness to light and from the authority of Satan to God. This is deliverance. Humanity needs deliverance. To turn from the dominion, the rule, the the kingship or power of Satan. He is called the God of this world. To be under his authority is to be in the slavery under his dominance. The dominance of mankind's great enemy. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit working in the sons of disobedience, the one who blinds the minds of the unbelieving. Jesus said in John 8, if you continue in my word, you are truly disciples of mine. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Jesus went on in John 8 to say everybody who sins in sort of this ongoing continual pattern of life is a slave of sin. But if the son makes you free... You're free from that dominion, that slavery. You see, apart from Christ, people are both perpetrators and victims of darkness. They are members of the world system, participants in the world system, and also entrapped as victims of that system. Paul was part of the system. Paul was the system. He was rescued out of the system, and now he's an enemy of the system, rescued from the system, on the run from the system, intent on rescuing others from the system. Every one of us, an evangelist, has that same story. You were the problem. You were part of the problem. You were the army aligned against God. And now God puts you by grace on the other team. The mass of humanity around us desperately needs sight so that they may turn. And they must turn so that they may receive. And notice this in verse 18. They are to receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among the sanctified. Let's start with forgiveness. This is humanity's fourth pressing need, the need of forgiveness in this passage. Sins are those things which displease God. They go against His ways, they dishonor Him, they provoke His holy justice. But those are actions that spring from our nature. We cannot relegate sins just to the level of outward activity. We do the outward things that come from the heart, from our nature, from who we are on the inside. 
Humanity's problems are at the very constitutional level of our makeup. There are problems that cannot be solved by achievement, by education, or self-improvement. The resources at the disposal of humanity are themselves corrupt and cannot be the solutions to the corruptions. They only make our natural condition more contemptible and more culpable before God. Do you remember Paul's descriptions in Philippians 3 of his own righteousness, his own heritage, his own religious efforts apart from Christ? Before he was a Christian, Paul held them up and said, before men, I'm blameless. I did everything right. I had the right pedigree, right lineage. I did all the right stuff. And to hold all of that human achievement up before a holy God as if God could accept such things from corrupt humans according to Paul, was to hold up a stinking pile of rubbish before God's nostrils and expect God to be pleased with it. That is the best man can offer. The filthy filthy rags and, and heaps of trash that stink to high heaven. Man needs something that he himself cannot provide. The thoughts, the intentions, the motives, the words, the actions that all proceed from man's corrupt nature, must be forgiven. Rather than being some sort of qualification that makes you okay with God, they actually offend the holiness of God. And so they need to be forgiven, not rehabilitated. Everything you had done before you knew Jesus needed to be forgiven. And now that you belong to Jesus, every sin is absolutely forgiven. This forgiveness only comes through the gospel. These four fundamental needs of man we've seen so far, spiritual sight, repentance, deliverance, and forgiveness, lead us to this last pressing need that Paul describes in verse 18 as an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in Jesus. We might call this belonging. The word saint just means to be separated out, to to be sanctified. Every Christian, by definition, is a saint. Every Christian, by definition, is set apart by grace, by God, unto God. And this is what humanity needs, to be removed from the solidarity with Adam and the mass of sinful humanity into the light and life of belonging to God through Christ. And in that belonging... The belonging is not only with God, but with all those who have likewise been set apart. It is a joining to a new identity and a a new segment of humanity. And this is what humans need, this belonging. The word here for inheritance is a share. In the ESV and the NIV, they call it a place. That is a, a lot or a portion Uh, Inheritance is a good word to describe this. In other words, you receive a legal right to belong, to belong to God and to His family, and to have all of the privileges in keeping with that belonging. What's implicit in this inheritance is the idea of adoption. That is a place in God's family. It's not where you started your life. You started out in the wrong family. But by God's grace in the gospel, through evangelism, believers get to be His. We get to belong to Him. We get to become inheritors of the treasure of that family. This belonging is is so precious. To be a part of this group of people already set apart and to be set apart with them. It's a great description of salvation. It is positional sanctification. Once and for all time, when your eyes are opened and you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and repentance, you immediately and forever irrevocably belong to Him and to His people. It's a transfer. With that new belonging comes an appointed possession. You have an inheritance with all of those who are separated out to belong to Jesus. We find similar wording in Acts 20, 32. The word of His grace is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Hebrews 9, 15 says, Those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. And 1 Peter 1, 4 says, You were born again to a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And this word inheritance in the New Testament takes sort of two sides of a theological perspective. The first is we get an inheritance. And this is an inheritance that is a treasure for us without the passing away of the owner. We actually get the one that we love and the riches of his household all at the same time. But secondly, according to Ephesians 1, we are said to be made an inheritance. In other words, God has seen fit to have a treasure for himself, which is a people for his own possession. And so we, we go from being the kinds of creatures that offend the holiness of God in the gospel to a kind of people that God treasures. It's a stunning reversal. What is the inheritance of this separated people? Our inheritance is God himself, the giver of all good things. He is the portion of his people, the inheritance of his people, the possession, the treasure, the reward of the saints. What does a sinful man have to do to have these pressing needs met, he has to recognize his own blindness. To see his need, he must look up and receive from Jesus what he could never produce for himself, spiritual sight. A spiritual sight leading to repentance and deliverance, leading to forgiveness and to belonging. Opened eyes allow the sinner to discern light from darkness, to turn to God from the slavery he's been under, to experience forgiveness of sin, and to bring him into relationship with his maker. So Paul's description of his job, his task, his ambassadorship, his commission from Jesus is to provide people what they most desperately need. You think about that. What what a great privilege it is to be evangelists on this earth. To know what everybody around you needs most and to actually have what they need and be ready to tell them about it. That doesn't mean people are going to listen. That doesn't mean people are going to take the news easily. That doesn't mean people are going to believe you when you say it. But it is a matter of great confidence, Christian, that you actually possess what everybody on the earth most desperately needs. And you can go out with boldness. And all you have to do, according to this verse, just open their eyes. How do we do that? This is impossible. It requires supernatural work. Does the Apostle Paul possess that kind of power? How could he be charged by Jesus with that task? Paul, just just go open everybody's eyes. How do we do that? We use the means God has declared for us. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Wherever you find yourself. Find yourself in trouble with the law? Preach the gospel. Um, They're uniquely a captive audience when you're in chains. Do exactly what Paul is doing here with King Agrippa. You see, Paul didn't see King Agrippa as merely a government official in the way of what Paul wanted to do, some official he needs to appease to get out of trouble, to Paul, Agrippa was a man in need of help. He was blind and he needed to see. He was reveling in the darkness and in need of repentance. He was a slave in need of deliverance. He was a sinner in need of forgiveness. He was an outsider in need of reconciliation. And these most pressing needs could only be met through faith in Jesus Notice the end of verse 18. An inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me, in Jesus. The content of what is needed in the gospel, Paul describes in verse 23. The Messiah, the Christ, was to suffer. And as the first of the resurrection from the dead, he's going to proclaim light to Jewish people and to Gentiles. The response is detailed in verse 20. I kept declaring both to those of Damascus and also to Jerusalem, throughout all the regions of Judea, even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, practicing deeds appropriate to repentance. 
Paul gives the content of the gospel, the necessary response of the gospel in his defense to King Agrippa. He's evangelizing. And Paul could only fulfill his job description by proclaiming the truth, by proclaiming the gospel, by telling people about Jesus. And what happens when we do this? Courageously, feebly, obediently, with trembling, not knowing all the answers to all the thorny questions some philosopher might ask, but confident about Jesus. What happens? God's servants speak words, and behind the scenes, in the heart, God does supernatural work. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God shines light into the heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So we think about that cemetery evangelism. You look out on the world, you see headstones, preach the gospel. And what happens? People walk out of tombs. Remember the commands from Scripture to circumcise your heart. Uh, to have a, a supernatural, spiritual surgery done on the inside. That's an appropriate obligation. God has the right to demand it, and we have no ability to do it. And we preach the gospel, and God does it in the heart. Remember the man with a withered hand? Jesus commanded him, stretch out your hand. He couldn't, and he did. Supernatural power. Remember the lame man? Jesus told, take up your pallet and walk. And he couldn't. He had to be lowered through the roof to be in the presence of Jesus. Jesus commanded, and with the command came supernatural power, and the layman got up and leapt. Remember Lazarus? Come forth. Who, who could obey that? In the grave four days, King James reports, he stinketh. And a dead man obeys the word of the living God. Why? Because there's power in the word. This is what gospel preaching is. And this was Messiah's mission all along. In fact, I think the wording that Paul gives here about opening their eyes in verse 18 comes from Isaiah 42, a description of Messiah's mission. Here's how God describes what Jesus would do when he came. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights, I put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. I am Yahweh. I've called you in righteousness. I will hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as the covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, those who dwell in darkness from prison. And I will lead the blind by a way they do not know, in paths they do not know, I will guide them. I will make darkness into light before them, and rugged places into plains. These are the things I will do, and will not leave them undone. God said He would do this very thing. And Jesus came as a light to the world, proclaimed the truth, and is the truth and died to secure the actual salvation of his people. And so Jesus' servants commissioned to go out with that message, faithfully proclaim those words, and in those words is the power to raise the dead, to set the captives free, to open blind eyes. It's the work that God does. And he does it through means. The means of the Apostle Paul in custody. Maybe he does it through you in your physical suffering. Maybe he does it through you in a difficult relationship. Maybe he does it through you in cold turkey evangelism on the streets. Maybe he does it through you by a patterned, faithful parenting that laboriously puts the gospel in words and in picture in front of children. This is the job description of all of us, the evangelist. Proclaim the word. Speak the word. And we must never underestimate the task. We must never underestimate the power of the one who is really doing the work. 
This is where we begin to appreciate God's impeccable work through blunt instruments. Think about an eye surgeon and what he has to do at work every day with, with such precision and care. If you gave to an eye surgeon a rusty flathead screwdriver, a chainsaw, and a garden rake, and said, remove the cataracts, <laughs> cure the blindness. If he is successful, the surgeon is praised, not the tools. We would just say, wow, look what God can do with a rusty flathead screwdriver when somebody believes the gospel. This is our task. I hope this series for you is liberating and normalizing. What are the great, big, mysterious secrets that make for great evangelists? Uh, getting saved and opening your mouth. Those are the big secrets. Don't be intimidated when people reject and scorn and don't immediately turn. Did you immediately turn the first time you heard the gospel? Listen, we make friends in the world for the sake of our ambassadorship of the King. If you see your job description as evangelist in this world, that ought to change every venue, every platform, every relationship. It's so easy to make friends because we want something from them. What if all of our friendships were defined by, I have something to give, something of eternal value in the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your kindness to save us, to turn on the light, to bring us to repentance, to give us forgiveness of sin and belonging to you. What immense privileges. We pray that we would not hold on to these things selfishly. We pray that we would see every day that you give us on your earth as another opportunity to make your greatness and your goodness and your grace in the gospel known. We have the answer because we have you and the needs are all around us. Would you raise up harvesters from every one of us to go out and to see what you will do in Jesus' name.